So we're going to talk about how to break out of the pack. And I am assuming that a lot of you are either already on your entrepreneurial journey or want to start it soon. And uh, I was sitting right where you're sitting just a couple years ago, dreaming about what my entrepreneurial journey would be. And now uh, I run a company that's one of the top 500 most traffic websites in the world. We get 20 million people a month coming to DocStock.com. We've helped millions and millions of small businesses. And we've got a growing organization of now 40 employees in our office by the beach in Santa Monica and getting bigger all the time. And what my goal today is the following. If I can share some of the stories from my life and that I've seen from other really successful entrepreneurs to show you how to break out of the pack and get what you want, which is namely to build the business of your dreams, whatever that business is, I feel like that will be an hour well spent. Do you guys agree? Yes. All right. So let's jump into it then. And I'm going to go over a couple different lessons. Number one, and the whole point of this talk, zig where others zag. We're talking about packs. We're talking about how to break out of that pack. You cannot do what everybody else does and expect meaningfully different results. Right? The quote by Albert Einstein, insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. The entire focus of this talk is going to show you how people that have built successful businesses do things in meaningfully different ways than everybody else. And just for my own personal example, when I was here going to law school, I had first started in business school and then I started going to law school here afterwards. And in my last year, I had the idea for DocStock. And I'd already started a business that I was running in grad school. And my entire last year of grad school, I don't think I went to more than 20% of my classes. Honest to goodness truth. And I didn't buy books and I didn't study and I just said to myself and to anyone that would listen, I don't care about grades. I gave up on them. And what I did focus my time on is I spent every day and every night from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. working with a development shop in India that I found that was, gonna, that was programming the first version of DocStock. And I was spending every last dime I had in savings. I put money on credit cards. I took out student loans just to pay this off. And people in law school thought I was crazy. They thought I was insane. They would ask me why I was there. I didn't show up to class. What are you doing here? And literally, I was like a leper. Nobody got me. Nobody understood me. And it was a little lonely because I was doing things differently than every single person here at Pepperdine. And guess what? I was the same way in business school. When I was in business school, I didn't care about grades. I cared about building connections to build a business. And what I realized is I had to do things meaningfully different than everybody else. And just ask yourself, how much time are you actually spending doing things differently than everybody else around you? Because if you want to break out of the pack, if you want to get different results, if you want to build a big business, you can't be doing what everyone else is doing. The second thing I realized is sometimes you have to think less. Sometimes thinking is what's going to prevent you from starting the business of your dreams. If I had known how difficult it was going to be <laughs> to start, run, and grow Dockstock, I don't think I would have done it. <laughs> I did not know what I was getting myself into. I did not know that I was going to be $60,000 in debt when I thought I'd be coming out of school debt free. I did not know that I would have to call on people to raise half a million dollars to keep it alive. I did not know that I would be working 18 hours a day, six days a week for two years straight. I did not know that I'd have to raise six months into raising half a million dollars, another $3.25 million to keep Doc Stock alive. 
Had I known these things, I probably wouldn't have done it. But there's a great parable, and for those of you who haven't read the book, Who Moved My Cheese, I'd recommend it. One of my favorite lines is, the quicker you let go of your old cheese, the sooner you find your new cheese. And Who Moved My Cheese is this fable about two mice and two little people. And every day, there's cheese that shows up there, and they eat their cheese. And they show up to the same spot every day, and their cheese is there. And one day, their cheese is gone. And the two mice kind of banter about, and then they're off. They're looking for new cheese. And the two little people sit there, and they wonder, well, maybe if I come back tomorrow, my cheese will be here. And then they try to rationalize where their cheese went. And they sulk, and they mope, and they whine, and they cry about where did their cheese go. And finally, one of the little people realize, I should be a lot more like my friends, the two mice. Because they didn't think about, why did I lose my old cheese? They just left and went, and they found their new cheese. And sometimes thinking is the enemy of doing. And when you're trying to break out of the pack, you, your biggest enemy is inertia. You need speed and momentum. And for that, many times, you don't need thought. Thought comes later when you find something that is working. Before you have something that's working, go, do, stop thinking. I can promise you all, you're thinking too much about how to be an entrepreneur, and you're not doing enough about being an entrepreneur. The third thing is, stop talking about yourself and others. And there's a great quote that I love that's typically attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. And it says, great minds think, talk about ideas. Average mind talk about events. Simple minds talk about people. How much, really, ask yourself, how much of your time do you spend thinking about yourself, the money you want to make, the body you want to have, the people you want to be in a relationship with, and also gossiping about other people. In my experience, that's most of what people think and talk about. And most of you, when I see you after this talk and you come up, you're going to start talking to me about you. Great people, great minds, great entrepreneurs, talk about ideas, and they take action on those ideas. Steve Jobs is famous for having this management style. There's this big Apple campus, and his, part of his management style is that he goes for these long walks, and while he's on these walks, his VPs and the people that report to him get time, and they discuss things while they're on the move. What do you think Steve Jobs was talking about? Do you think he was talking about himself? Do you think he was gossiping about other people at Apple? Or do you think he was talking about this big idea he had to revolutionize the music industry, to revolutionize the film industry, to deliver the most delightful products to people that they've ever seen in their entire life, and then said, hey, this is not enough to talk about these ideas. We're going to take action on them. There's too much of our time that we spend thinking, talking about ourselves, and gossiping about other people. Truly great entrepreneurs, people that break out of the pack, think about ideas, and then take action on them. Mistakes. Repeat them, own them, and then make new ones. Right? There's the adage, don't ever make the same mistake twice. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're going to have to make the same mistake many times over. Have you ever learned anything new once? If I told you a, a new sentence in a foreign language, are you going to remember it after I tell you the first time? If I had you play a sport that you've never played before, are you going to get it by doing it one time? No. You have to repeat things over and over again until you internalize that lesson. It's the same thing with mistakes. You're not going to learn from your mistakes the first time. You're going to have to make them a couple times, but make them quickly and then eventually own those mistakes and stop making them and move on to new ones. 
All of life's about making mistakes. You should embrace making mistakes. You should run into making mistakes as quickly as possible. You should be okay repeating mistakes just enough times to never repeat them anymore and then move on to new mistakes you're going to make. And when I first started DocStoc, I made every mistake in the book, and I still am. And one of the big ones that I made that it took me not one, two, three, four times to learn from was to make sure to appreciate and compliment my employees, the people working for us in the office. I was so driven. I was so nose to the grind. I was so, you know, such a high bar for excellence that nothing was ever good enough. And I never wanted any of the people working in my company to feel like we had done a good enough job. On the day that we launched DocStock, we had 40,000 people come to our website the first day. And my co-founder and the developers who had been working on this site for you know, months to bring it to life and been pulling all-nighters, were like, this is amazing. We pulled it off. We launched it. We had all these people. And I was pissed. I was pissed that it wasn't 100,000 people that came to the website. And the folks in my company would tell me over and over again, look, like, you need to compliment people. You need to ease up a little bit. You need to appreciate people. It's not going to want to make them work less hard. And finally, one day, my co-founder literally pulled me out of my office and took me for a walk. And he's like, Jason, you are being a dick. <laughs> and you've got to appreciate and validate our employees this is not sustainable what you're doing. And guess what? Like that was the third, fourth time I'd heard that message and that was the most direct I'd heard it. But it still took me a while to internalize it. But now I think I spend a lot of time making sure every single employee in our office knows what they're doing well, knows what they're appreciated for, knows where they can get better. And the critical feedback is always complemented with what we appreciate and validate and are thankful for for the people in our office. To break out of the pact, you should be uncomfortable. All learning, all growth is accompanied by uncomfortability. Th think of anything new that you do where you're pushing yourself, stretching your boundaries. It's uncomfortable. It's not comfortable to work out. It's not comfortable to learn a new sport. It's not comfortable to push yourself in business school and learn new classes and topics that you've never had to study before. But uncomfortability is what leads to growth. And breaking out of the pack takes a commitment to growth. And so what I've always tried to do is to purposely, intentionally, and quite often put myself in uncomfortable situations. When I graduated, undergrad. I was supposed to go to law school at the time and decided I wasn't going to do it. And not for a period of time, I thought, hey, I don't know if I'll ever go. And I told myself and anyone that would listen, I was going to be a motivational speaker. How? I had no idea. Well, a couple months later, I ended up doing three things. First, I found a company that would send me to talk to high school students. And listen, I wasn't the cool kid or popular kid in high school. And I would go back to these high schools, and there'd be a gym of 600 kids. And one time, I went to an all-girls school, and they were like clapping and cheering. I walked in, and I was like, whoa, what is happening here? I've never had one girl clap or cheer for me, let alone 600. <laughs> and I would have to give these speeches to these high school students on how to be successful in high school and how to pursue their dreams in college. Listen, if it is terrifying, it is terrifying to have to talk in front of 600 16-year-old girls. I don't think I've ever done anything as frightening in my entire life. I then also found a way to go do seminars on communications and negotiations and sales to people that were, you know, directors in various positions in corporate America. And here I was, 21. I had never had a job in my life, and I was telling these people, 
hey, here's how you get better at sales, here's how you get better at negotiations. And all I did was read other people's books and regurgitate these lessons. That's kind of uncomfortable. You know, people would ask me, why are you qualified? Why are you talking to us? And just sat through it. The third thing that I did is I actually took, when I was graduating undergrad, a weekend class that certified me in hypnosis. I am a certified, after one weekend, hypnotherapist. <laughs> and for one hour in that weekend class, the cost of whopping $199, there was an hour video on how to do a stage hypnosis show. And I started telling people I knew how to do stage hypnosis shows. I did not know how to do stage hypnosis shows. And eventually somebody asked me, well, will you come do a stage hypnosis show for our school? And I said, sure. And I practiced doing the stage hypnosis show before I did that first one. And it went really badly. <laughs> I mean, it did not work at all. And I had to walk into a fraternity event in front of 400 people and hypnotize people. That was kind of uncomfortable, let me tell you. <laughs> but I went on to go do about another 30 of those shows over the course of a year. And so what I've constantly done in my professional career is seek out situations that are really uncomfortable that then lead to growth. And I didn't know at the time when I was talking to 16-year-old high school girls and delivering message about sales to people who'd been in the workforce for 30 years and doing stage hypnosis shows, that that year of public speaking would be one of the most important things that I ever did to raise $4 million. And you are not going to know how the situations that you put yourself in when you're uncomfortable are going to help you out later down the road, but I promise you they will. When you're breaking out of the pack, Forget 80-20, it's 99-1. And of every quote I have on this deck, my favorite one is from my father, who is a big fan of often saying, congratulations, Jason, I'll give you a shit medal. <laughs> hey, Dad, I got into business school. Congratulations, Jason, I'll give you a shit medal. <laughs> hey, Dad, I just started a new company. Congratulations, Jason, I'll give you a shit medal. <laughs> And when you have an 82-year-old Persian Jew telling you this, it's, ugh, what's, what's going on here? I'm actually afraid one day he will give me a medal made of shit. <laughs> We've all heard that 80% of the results come from 20% of what we do, the Pareto Principle. And you know what? When you've got a big organization and something's working and running, that is true. 80% of the results come from 20% of what you do. But when you're breaking out of the pack, when you're starting your entrepreneurial journey, when you need to create something that doesn't exist, 99% of your results come from one thing that you do. There is one most important thing for you to do in your entrepreneurial journey right now. I don't know what it is, but I know there's one thing. And for us, when I was in law school, and there were all these distractions, and I could have very easily had any good reason to back out why we weren't going to do Doc Stock, my first one thing was, I am going to get this product launched, and I'm going to get it live on the internet no matter what. That was my first one thing. You know what my next one thing was? I'm going to find a way to make sure that we get lots of traffic. I'm not going to take for granted that here we build it, and then they come. I'm going to do anything and everything I can do in my ability and spend every waking moment figuring out how we're going to get lots of traffic. Guess what? Two years into DocStock, we had 10 million people a month coming to the website. Then we move to the next one thing, which is we do not want to have to be beholden to raising money for the rest of our life in DocStock and continue to dilute our ownership stake in this company. We have to find a way to make the company profitable. We have to find a way to make the revenue grow. And if I actually look back on the five plus year history of DocStock now, there have been about four decisions that I made that have led to 99% of our success. Everything else goes by the wayside. 
when you are starting out, when you're in the beginning, when you're trying to break out of the pack, it's one thing, not many, not 20%, it's one thing that's going to lead to all the most important results you need to get. So focus on that one thing, or else you may be getting a shit medal from me. <laughs> be a critical optimist. F. Scott Fitzgerald, it's the sign of a truly intelligent mind that they can hold two opposing ideas at the same time and still to continue to function. I love that quote. I think every politician should have to internalize that quote. The most successful people are simultaneously the most optimistic and the most critical. Just think of Walt Disney. Walt Disney, imagine that you're the investor hearing the pitch, 1940s. I'm going to build this land of puppet animals. And there's going to be rides, and we're going to call it the land of Disney, Disneyland. And it's going to be the world's most popular attraction ever. You would think this guy is off his rocker. He had to be this optimist that could see things that nobody else could see. But simultaneously, if you read about Disney, if you read his biographies, if you read what other people have written about him, he is one of the most self-critical people you will ever meet. He was constantly trying to prove on things. He was constantly critical of the work that he was putting out, that his company was putting out. And what great people do, people that break out of the pack, do is they have an ability to simultaneously be critical about their own strengths and weaknesses and always want to get better while portraying and believing in a sense of optimism that they can do anything. Improve every day, Kaizen. There's, uh, this was really popular in the mid to late 80s and early 90s. It was a management technique that came out of Japan. And Kaizen is this idea of continuous improvement. And this philosophy spurred the discipline that revolutionized car manufacturing in Japan in the 80s that then we in the United States tried to incorporate ourselves. And it's the idea that every single day push yourself to be better. If you had to ask yourself the following question, how much better am I professionally today than, I wa than what I was a year ago, five years ago? Can you really say you're absolutely proud of where you're at today? That you've done everything you can to push yourself as far as you can go? And one of my favorite books is called Talent is Overrated. And it talks about these people throughout history that we believe to be the most gifted amongst us all. Mozart, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. And we assume that they have these God-given gifts of athleticism or geniusness that separates them from everybody else. But what the research shows is that's not true at all. That in many ways, they are no different than a lot of the other people that are their counterparts. What makes them special is not their talent, but a systematic, disciplined approach to practice that constantly pushes them outside of their boundaries. Jerry Rice was not the greatest wide receiver because he was just more physically gifted than anyone. Jerry Rice was the greatest wide receiver because he had a practice regimen that was insane. And every week, every year, he constantly pushed himself to do new things that he didn't know how to do. And most of us, when we do things and practice things, we do what we're good at and we get incrementally better at the things we're already good at. What we don't do is push ourselves in new and meaningful ways. And Mozart, what the research shows, wasn't just this child savant. Mozart had a father who himself was an amazing pianist and composer, right? an extremely driven and an extremely disciplined teacher. And by the age of three, Mozart had already practiced more hours than people four or five times his age, and in a way that was so systematically rigorous and disciplined that it created 
what we believe is genius. It's not genius. It's a commitment to improve every single day in the most meaningful ways and not just doing the things we're already good at, but pushing ourselves to do new things. Everyone here, we're all familiar with, the ends justify the means. I like to flip the script on that and say, the means will justify the end. The ends justify the means is, hey, there's this thing that's so important that I want so much so badly that I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to that result. The means justifies the ends is about do things right, enjoy the process, enjoy the entrepreneurial journey, and the ends will materialize. And what's important about this more specifically, and we all know the adage, follow what you love, follow your passion, and the success will come. But what really successful entrepreneurs do is they're better than anyone else at working in flow. And you all know what that is. When you're in flow, it's an activity that you're doing that you are so concentrated on that you lose track of time. So just think of the activities that you do where you lose track of time. Is it reading? Is it working out? Is it writing? Is it working on a group project? Is it brainstorming ideas? What are the things that you do where you're in flow and you just lose track of time? That's what the entrepreneurial journey is about. It's about living in those moments because that's what success and happiness is really about. And Tony Shea, who is the founder of Zappos, talks about this a lot and has a great book about happiness and he talks about flow being one of the key components to being happy. And my recommendation is if you want to break out of the pack and have this big successful life, don't focus on the end, focus on the means. Focus on enjoying the journey, focus on being in flow, and you'll see those ends materialize. So now we get to kind of my last three points about how to break out of the pack, and these are maybe a little bit less business specific, and a little bit more personal, and we'll call it meta, meta world peace. So the first thing is, the first of these last three points, I think all of self-improvement is really just two questions. All of self-improvement. You can take every self-improvement book, you can take every ideology, you can take every seminar, and for me it boils down to two questions. The first of those questions being, what are you pretending not to know? And my best friend uh, told me this about two years ago, and when he said it, it just struck me like a lightning bolt. Jason, what are you pretending not to know? William Shakespeare, to thy own self be true. No improvement can be made, no breaking out of a pack can be made until we first are willing to ask ourselves and be honest about what are we pretending not to know? That our health is bad, that we're, that we're not working on the things that we should, that we're incongruent in our lives, that we're not actually the person that we say we are and portray others to be? The second question is why aren't we doing the things that we know we should be doing? We know what to do. We know we should be eating well. We know we should be working hard. We know we should be treating the people we love with kindness and respect. We know that we should be focusing not only on ourselves but others. We know that we should love ourselves and do things to improve our own life and the people we care about most. Life's not about figuring out what to do. Life's about figuring out why don't we do those things we know we should be doing. And the people that I know that are the most successful and really are differentiated than everyone else I know live those two questions and constantly seek to improve themselves on those two questions. Don't be an extra in your own movie. My absolute favorite quote of all time 
is by Theodore Roosevelt, and it's most widely known as The Man in the Arena. And it talks about, it's not the critic who counts, it's the man in the arena, the person that, even if he fails, does so by triumphantly daring to do something great. And when he succeeds, knows the victory that no one else will know. But in either case, is not that hapless bystander that knows neither the pains of defeat nor the glory of victory. And I'd recommend that all of you go look up Man in the Arena, Theodore Roosevelt, and read it today. And I like to think of my life as a movie. And just think of the following. At some point, all of our lives are going to be done. They're going to be finished. And whatever you think happens afterwards, this life is one complete work. And there's a start, and there's a middle, and there's an end. And that's your movie. Are you an extra in your movie? Does your story happen and you just happen to be there? Are the main characters and actors not you, but all the people around you, and you're just a background event in the scene? Or are you really taking control of your story? Are you shaping your movie? Are you the director and decide what today's scene is and what the next experience is? Are you the star of that movie where you get the glory when things go well? And I feel like too many of us, too often, are just extras in our own movie. When we should be the directors, we should be the stars, we should be the producers. And realize that we can shape our movie to be anything that we want it to be. And truly exceptional people that break out of the path, that's what they think. That's what they act on. That they can shape their destiny to be anything that they want it to be. My last point is not so much about us individually. It's a little bit more of a meta one. And the question is, can you be the 100th monkey? And there's a, a story I'd like to share with you. And it, it's a true story. There, uh, there's an island in J Japan called Koshima. And it's inhabited with monkeys. And there are multiple islands around the area that are inhabited with monkeys as well. And in 1952, some scientists were running an experiment. And they would drop in sweet potatoes onto the island of Koshima. And the monkeys loved these sweet potatoes. There wasn't anything on the island that tasted like them. They were very sweet. But they dropped them in the sand. And so they were, had a bitter texture to them. And eventually one day, the first one of the monkeys, she was very smart, and she walked uh, over to the ocean, and she bathed her sweet potato in the water and realized it didn't have a bitter taste at all afterwards. And slowly but surely, some of the monkeys started following the suit, copying her behavior. And it was about six years in, it was 1958, and about half the monkeys on this island were following suit, and they'd go take these sweet potatoes and wash them, and then they'd eat them. But it seemed like the older monkeys were more set in their ways. They didn't really want to change what they were doing. They kind of kept the way they were. And then inexplicably and suddenly, and we don't know exactly the number of monkeys, but for the purpose of the story, let's say it was the hundredth monkey that then followed suit and washed a potato for the first time. Completely inexplicably, when after that hundredth monkey started washing the, the sweet potato the same way as everyone else, almost instantly, every single other monkey on the island followed suit. And every monkey on the island started washing their, potato, washing their sweet potatoes before they ate them. And what was it? What was it about that tipping point, that hundredth monkey that then caused all the other monkeys to follow suit. But that's not the really interesting thing. The really crazy thing was that on an island a couple miles away, separated by water, with no communication between that island and Koshima, 
almost instantly and simultaneously, all of the monkeys on that island started washing their sweet potatoes in the water. And there's something that happens when a behavior, when an idea, when a movement becomes prevalent enough that it becomes part of our collective consciousness, the part of the way that we all do things. For the last 50 to 100 years, there hasn't been any desire for democracy or representative government in the Middle East. And now all of a sudden, in a, in a period of a year, where countries that don't talk to each other or really have any big trade relations, they're all simultaneously wanting to have representative governments in the Middle East. And part of breaking out of the pact is not just our own ability to manifest the things that we want. But hopefully, all of us in our lives will focus on how do we make this institution, how do we make this country, how do we make this world a better place? And we'll, not ha we'll have to not only move ourselves, but we'll have to move the pack. And that's not an easy thing to do. But I would encourage each of you to think about is that any of us could be that hundredth monkey. That person that by doing that deed, thinking that way, representing ourselves in a certain light, moves everybody else, creates a collective consciousness, and not only affects our own life and our own entrepreneurial journey, but has the ability to affect thousands or millions of people around us. And that's in part my goal. That's what I want to do in my life. And that's why I'm here today. And I don't think there's anything that I've said that you haven't heard before. And I don't think there's anything that I told you that you didn't know. I'm just hoping that I might be the hundredth monkey and help some of you fulfill your entrepreneurial journey. So thanks for having me today. Hi. What, what's your name? Nice to meet you, Helene. Too many to keep track of. Yeah, and I had this, uh, you can see it. I took, uh, I had no design or art skills whatsoever. And I created this presentation in my first month of my last year of law school called Doc Brary. That was the original name. There were actually a bunch of names for doc, doc stock, including document exchange that I called excument, which sounds a lot like excrement. <laughs> so we quickly vetoed that idea, one of the many mistakes I made. And there's a presentation on doc stock called The Genesis of Doc Stock. You can look it up. It's six slides. It looks like it was created by a monkey. I don't think I would have even deserved the shit medal for that. And I went around and I showed everybody that I could these mocks that I did in MS Paint, which was the extent of my technical capability and knowledge, cut and paste and boxes. Here's what I'm going to do. And I actually tried to recruit a lot of my classmates to come do this with me. And mostly in vain, although some of them did become our early investors. Um, and actually, my, uh, one of my classmates in business school, I just hired and he's now the CEO of the company. And uh, a lot of people told me I wasn't going to be able to do it. And for me, at least, that was great. It, it fueled the fire. I was like, every single person that said I wasn't going to be able to do it, this was just another person I was going to be able to, in my mind, mentally check off and be like, ha ha! <laughs> so yeah, it was a lot, as it should be. And you know what? There was nothing special or great about the idea. And one of the things I often talk about is it's not ideas that make something successful. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution of those ideas. And so anytime someone tells you that you are not going to be successful, don't even worry about the idea that the single biggest determining factor is your own desire to be persistent, disciplined, and iterate at all costs. Thanks, Lena.
Thanks, Armin. Nice to meet you. That's a good question. So our challenge is, our, our big challenge is we've continued to scale revenue in the company and for the last couple of years we've had 100% year uh, revenue growth. I think we're, now that we're kind of at that double digit million number, it, I think that becomes harder and harder. And so it's our belief that it's not only through the web property docsoc.com, but new uh, products we're going to have to build that we're going to really build this into a company that's, you know, really big and can grow. and what our ultimate mission is, which is to help improve every small business. So we're simultaneously now running a company of 40 people, but also going through that entrepreneurial process all over again, where we have three completely new products we're building that really aren't at all specifically connected to DocStock. And you know, we've got to hope that one of those breaks out of the pack. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Jason. Nice to meet you, Jason. Nice to meet you. That's a good question, Jason. I, I think that's the wrong, I think it's the wrong thing to be thinking about multiple ideas while you're pursuing one. You always know, I mean, ideas are in the ether. You can pull one out at any time. I think that's often just the hedge and gives you an excuse for why something's not successful. So to say, hey, I've got this idea, but I've got these three others, that sounds to me like an excuse. It sounds to me like, hey, I kind of want to marry this girl, but if that doesn't work out, I've got these three other girls you know, I can go on a date with and hook up with. I mean, if you told that to that girl, I mean, she'd be kind of pissed at you. I don't think she's going to marry you. And I, I, would, I would treat business ideas like your future spouse. Pick one and go with it. If it doesn't work out, then you can go for the next one. <laughs> yes? What's your name? It's Vicky? Yeah. That's a great name. Thank you. Uh, so, Jason, you have delivered a truly very nice talk. But my question you present with the monkeys, you know, in the uh, course of the example, they follow the positive, the good things. <coughs> but what about you consider, you know, bad, bad things? If that take them, the template works as well. I mean, I, I hope that we as a people, we do not follow the bad things in a collective way. So, uh, we have uh, many examples within the organizational behavior that show, to some certain extent, I do not put ma much evidence, to some certain extent, in the story in society, that in, uh, a big group of people in a collective way they follow, in fact, the bad things. What do you think? That's a great question. I, I, I'm not here to talk about. Um, sure. So, I, I think his question really surrounded around. Um, what if people, you know, fall collectivism to things that we don't agree um, are an intent that we want? Listen, there was a 99th monkey in uh, Nazi Germany in the late 30s that ultimately so someone or some event was the 99th monkey. At some point, there was a, became a collective consciousness. It's okay to persecute an entire race of people and go to war. Uh, the same principles that are going to lead to positive movements are the same principles going to lead to movements that we look back with retrospect and say are the worst things that could have ever happened in humanity. I don't think I'm in the place, nor am I here today, to talk, to judge what should be a good movement or a bad movement. I'm simply here to say these are the principles that people apply to break out of the pact for good or for bad. And the last point being is here's how you move collectively the consciousness. Here's how you move people in mass. And, you know, I hope that you do it for something good in your life, as do I. Thanks, Jason. Great talk. We appreciate you Thanks. tweeting your quotes. And in tweeting, I discovered that. What was your name? Uh, Donna. Nice to meet you, Donna. You can actually find this talk on Twitter, right? So you can, we want to find it. Yeah, well, this presentation's on Docs, though. Okay, great. So, um, <laughs> well, my question you mentioned MS Paint and not, I'm taking it you're not technical. I'm not technical. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of talk about if you are want to found a company or start a company and you're not technical, there's different ways to overcome that. And I'm just wondering how you overcame having technology based a company and not being your, your job as an entrepreneur is to be the producer of a movie. The producer doesn't act in it. It probably would be horrible if he or she did. Doesn't direct it, doesn't write the script, 
they bring together the part, at least this is my view of entrepreneurship, right? Is they bring together each of the different specialists that then create this wonderful piece of work. Now, if you happen to be a specialist in an area, if you happen to be you know, great at technical or great at sales or great at management, that only adds to it overall. But the reason why I think people, the big mistake I think people make is they feel, I, I know that you have heard and you have probably often said yourself, oh, I just need to get more knowledge or information until I think I could do that. I, I'm not ready to be an entrepreneur yet. I know 50, uh, there, was, there, I, there was a 17-year-old that came into my office last week who just raised $5 million for his business. Do you think that 17-year-old knows what the heck he's doing? No, but he's going to figure out along the way. He doesn't know tech. He doesn't know sales. He doesn't know management. He certainly doesn't have a lot of experience, but he's got chutzpah, right? <laughs> And he's bringing together a lot of other pieces. So I wouldn't worry about what technical knowledge you do or don't have. Those, if you have those skills, they're certainly a benefit, but they're not necessary for getting your business off the ground. And look, as your business grows, you are not going to be doing things anyway. One of my board members, who was the previous president of MySpace, started a company called UserPlane and sold it to AOL, one of the best known entrepreneurs in LA, Michael Jones, told me a year into my business, Jason, your goal is not to do anything. You should not be doing any of the stuff that needs to get done in your company. If you are, you're doing it the wrong way. It was really hard to, I mean, I was like, here I was working 18 hours a day. I mean, anything that needed to get done, I was doing, answering customer service emails, taking out the trash, trying to raise money. Like, I own the spectrum, and I validated myself for that. Oh, look at me. Oh, I can do everything myself. Well, that's a pretty crappy way to run a business. You're going to burn out pretty soon. You know, and it was a really smart person that told me a long time ago, you know, um, build a product-based business because service-based businesses, like, are you going to cap out? Right? And she's sitting in the room here today. It's Janet Kerr. And so your goal as a business owner is not to do things yourself, but to get other people to do those things for you. And in the beginning, it's, it's an art. It's a game because you don't have resources. You don't have money. And you have to get people to do things for you based on future promises that are then created, made sincere by your own certainty. But later on, you have a team and you have money and I wouldn't worry about what you do or don't know. I would just worry about what you can bring together to make something great. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, um, how do you fight resistance to change? How do you convince people to do something different when they're used to doing it their way? Let's say for dark stuff, for example, if I want to yeah, absolutely. So it, it uh, so there's a whole talk I gave, and you can find it if you if you just Google how to persuade people. But the basic tr the basic crux of the entire talk I gave on how to persuade people is that um, you get people to do things that they don't want to do. You get them to change by showing them that it's in their best interest and making it about them. So uh, when I'm here today, I'm not thinking about myself. And the reason why when some of you, if I were to call up any of you and say, hey, why don't you stand up here and talk to everybody for the next 10 minutes, a lot of us are going to get nervous, right? I don't. And I'll tell you why I don't. And it's not because I've done this all these times. It's not because I'm any different than you. It's because I realize you don't care about me. You care about you, as you should. And my goal here today is talk to you about you and what you want and what you can get. So the only way I will change somebody's behavior of using DocStock if they don't want to is if I can show them a compelling reason and a benefit to them that outweighs something that they're already doing. If I can't, why would they change? And why would I try to get them to change? You can't change everybody. You can't persuade everybody. But you can show people how to get something for themselves in a better way. And often when you do that, you'll optimize your chance of getting people to change their own behavior. Hey, nice to see you. Gerald, oh. I know you didn't uh, start out saying, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. There was a tipping point there. When did you change your mind and how did that affect your life? In my case, I think I started relatively young thinking that. I mean, I, 
I never saw my dad go to a job. I was always pretty precocious. I didn't like people telling me what to do. So I, I actually never assumed I would work for anybody. In fact, I've never really had a job. The one job I ever had was I worked in a startup for one year in between starting my own company and going back to grad school. Um, so what was my tipping point? I don't know, I was three. <laughs> Uh, but whether, listen, whether you know from a young age that you want to be an entrepreneur, whether you start your first business at 70 years old, whether you have a background in sales and think you're the most charismatic person in the world, whether you're, you know, a geeky tech person that doesn't like hanging out with other people, there is no mold that makes a perfect entrepreneur. There's no mold that makes an entrepreneur except for one thing, that you're willing to do the things that other people don't do. It goes to the very first thing we talked about, zig when other people zag. And I think in my case, the benefits of being an entrepreneur always weighed out in my mind what would be the consequences and responsibilities of it. Um, and so for me, I think I knew from a young age that um, I just didn't want to be told, being told what to do all day long. But you're, somebody's always telling you what to do. I mean, the fallacy of entrepreneurship is that you don't have a boss. You, you, have, you have multiple bosses. Not only do I have a board of directors that are actually technically my boss and could fire me at any time, but I have millions of customers. And guess what? If I don't do things and the company doesn't do things that they like, we're kind of in big trouble. And so you always got a boss. You always got somebody to answer to. But specifically, I think in my case, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yes. Are we doing okay on time? Just one more question. Okay. You better make it a good one. Don't mess us up. Seriously. <laughs> uh, I, I, my name's Tommy, and I'm very inspired by your, Thank you. your story. I was curious, you mentioned your dad never had a job. May I ask what he did? Yeah, so my dad was an immigrant. He came to the country in 1955. I'm not sure he really even, you know, ever finished high school. And when he first came here, he worked for... Um, he worked for a dollar an hour selling women's lingerie. And I remember he told me he got a nickel raise. And he's, and he's like, what was a nickel? I didn't know at the time. <laughs> he told me I got a nickel raise. And uh, they, he and my mom met in New York, and they had three kids there. And then they came out to LA. And I came around much later. And um, eventually, they got into real estate. So our family owns a, a couple apartment buildings now. Yeah.